Thank you for the wonderful introduction. And it's my wonderful pleasure to travel for two days to get here to talk to all of you about the arrow of time in quantum measurement. Before I get too enthusiastic about the topic, I want to acknowledge some of the funding that made this research possible. So the National Fine Science Foundation, the Sloan Fellowship, and the John Templeton Foundation have supported this research. And also my colleague Andrew Jordan, who's a theoretical physicist at the University of Rochester, has been collaborating with me on this project. Now, there's this picture of a, of a certain person on the title of this talk. Does anyone know who this is? Janice. Janice. Janice is the Roman god of beginnings and endings, gates, passageways, transitions, and time. Janice has one face that faces forward, looking at the future, and one that looks backward at the past. It's the perfect person to highlight the idea of time. And the certain symmetry there is to time. You can look back at the past, you can look forward to the future, but also the asymmetry in time, and that time seems to go forward. So let's start with the obvious, which is that time seems to go forward. Would we all agree? Yeah. It's just this picture here of a broken glass tells a story of a before and an after. And before the glass was intact, at some point the speaker knocked the glass on the floor, it broke, and afterwards it you know, went into the trash because it will not be put back together again. So we all agree that time goes forward, and the question that many physicists, when they become old enough and crazy enough to think about questions that are not possible to answer, start to ask, and I'm not quite that old yet, <laughs> they ask, why does time go forward? It seems sort of strange. And the reason, oh, so before we get into why you might ask this, let me point out that physics has a, a fancy name for the arrow of time. It's called the second law of thermodynamics. And it's a sort of strange law because it's not such a hard and fast law, it's more of a rule of thumb. And it says that a quantity called entropy, which somehow is related to disorder, the entropy sort of always increases. Okay? And that's the rule of thumb that says time goes forward. Entropy increases, time goes forward. The classic example of this process is, take for example my bedroom. It's nice and neat at one point, and later on, it's all messy and disordered. You can see there's only one way to make the room neat. Everything is in its spot. This little toy is up on the shelf. The bed is made. Everything is put away. One way to be clean and tight and ordered. And there's many ways for it to be disordered and messy. Okay, so the, the second law of thermodynamics says, generally things are going to go this way, before, after, because disorder corresponds to higher entropy. Right? That's what your room looks like, too. Let me point out that it's also this, this example, example shows that there's some relationship between this entropy and disorder and work and energy, right? Because when my room looks like this, I have to go and clean it up, and that costs me work and time. I have to go do all this work to get it clean again. So there's a deep relationship between entropy and energy, which we won't really talk about in this talk, but I'll just point out that it's there. So there's the second law of thermodynamics, but the reason why you might ask why does time seem to go forward is because the fundamental laws of physics that describe motion and how things move and so forth are time reversible. They don't distinguish the future from the past. Okay? So this is true of the Newton's laws which describe sort of classical, uh, classical things, large things, like how a bottle of water, if I throw it up in the air, how it spins and it, it, how it lands in my hands. If it's just if I just know exactly what I do at the beginning, these laws tell me everything about how it moves until it comes back to my hand. Okay? Those laws are reversible. The same thing goes perfectly well in reverse. It's also true of quantum mechanics, that the fundamental equations that govern quantum evolution are also time reversible. They don't distinguish the past from the future. So if the laws we have that describe physics don't distinguish the past from the future, why does time go forward? That's the question I'm asking. So we're gonna get into these questions 
through some examples and we'll, we'll try to explore this idea in this talk. So I put out some equations just so you knew I'd be serious. You don't have to look at them. These are Hamilton's equations that describe class civil motion. You could just think of them as, well, you can think of their equations. I tell you the initial conditions. They tell you what happens. And the point I want to make is if you just replace time going to minus time, so you reverse time and you reverse momentum, these equations play perfectly well backwards just as they played forwards. So you can imagine it's a, it's a video cassette. You press play to watch the video play forward, press rewind to wa play, watch it go backwards. The equations work in both directions. So my colleague Andrew Jordan and I were exploring this question. We thought, well, if we just play the movie backwards, what can we learn? Now, Andrew is a theoretical physicist. I'm an experimental physicist. He's not allowed in my laboratory. Okay? <laughs> but he wanted to do some experiments. So his only recourse was to go down to the pool hall. I don't know if you play pool here. It's like billiards. Um, and to do some experiments in the pool hall. So I'm going to show you some of his experiments. And the experiments basically involve taking a video of something like what is called a pool break. And we'll look at this video played forward and the video played backwards. And we'll try to guess which way is time going just by looking at the video. Does that sound like fun? Let's try. So here's the first experimental test that Andrew did. I'll play one video. OK. Now the next video. So one of these videos that is playing forward as it was recorded, and one we've just reversed, we've played it backwards. And it's your job to guess which one is going forwards and which one is going backwards. What do you think? Some people are shaking their heads. The point is, you shouldn't be able to tell. If you're really clever, you can see, you know what, this one is, seems like it's speeding up. And the other one seems like it's slowing down. It could be that the, the table is tilted. Or it could be that there's some friction slowing it down, and that's actually what's going on. There's some friction, so if you look really carefully, you'll find that this one's going forward, this one's going backward. But if there was no friction, you would not be able to tell which one is going forward, which one's going backward. That's what I mean by saying these laws of mechanics don't distinguish past and future. They don't distinguish forward from backward. Okay, so let's make it a little more complicated. So here's two particles. I have to figure out how to stop the sound. It's kind of confusing. It won't work. Anyway, the, so can you guess there? And this is a little more obvious because of the, 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 the friction. And the sound also gives it away in some sense. So this one is forward. This one's backwards. But again, in the absence of friction, you wouldn't be able to tell. So the next layer of experience, and we have three particles. So here's one. And there's that one. Again, it's still challenging to tell which one's playing forwards and which one's playing backwards. To look at hints of friction or way, the way it sounds, if you could hear that. Okay. So it really takes a situation where we have many, many, many particles before we can really tell for sure by watching one of these videos whether it's playing forward or backward. So here is the most complicated situation we can create in the pool hall, the pool break. <coughs> And in reverse. So in this case, it's crystal clear which one's playing forward and which one's playing backwards. Right? And it has to do with the transition from ordered to disordered. Here, if you go to the initial condition, which is this, it's ordered. All the pool walls are stacked in this nice triangle. And the final condition is disordered. They're spread out all over the table. So that the way that we intuitively can tell whether or not the movie is playing forwards or backwards is really just a statement of the second law of thermodynamics that things tend to go from order to disorder. So we can see that just at the level of the pool hall table. So Andrew did these experiments. He was very proud of the experiments because it shows us so nicely and it was obviously very fun. Uh, but I said to Andrew, hey, wait, let's, let's look a little closer. After all, these pool balls are not just particle, single particles. If you look very closely, they're made of atoms and molecules. 
a very large number of atoms and molecules in each pool walk. And the physics that governs these atoms and molecules is a different kind of physics. It's quantum physics. It's not the same classical physics that we had before. So maybe those experiments are all wrong because they're kind of forgetting about the fact that really quantum mechanics is what's happening at the most fundamental level. But I told you at the beginning that it turns out that the laws of quantum mechanics that, that govern quantum motion, that is the Schrodinger equation, looks very complicated, let's cover it up. This equation is also time reversible. It doesn't distinguish forwards from backwards. So we're going to end up in sort of the same predicament we had before. Except that there's one piece of quantum mechanics that's a little different, and that has to do with measurement. Now many of you, I don't know if you've heard this before, but in quantum mechanics, the story goes, you have something called a quantum superposition. I'll explain what this is eventually. Some sort of spooky thing. And what happens when you measure it? I heard the word collapse. You get a wave function collapse, right? Now it looks like this. <laughs> it's kind of like that glass that broke at the beginning of my talk. Uh, turns out St. Louis is famous for having an arch. So this is St. Louis, and you can tell these are the kind of experiments we do in my lab because it's St. Louis. So wave function collapse. This strange aspect of quantum measurement and wave function collapse is epitomized by Schrodinger's cat. It's a thought experiment many of you may have heard of. The experiment goes as such. We have a radioactive atom in this box here that if the atom decays, the emitted uh, particle will be detected by this detector and it will drop the hammer to smash a vial of poison that will then kill the cat that happens to be in this box. Okay? So the atom decays, the hammer drops, poison vial spills, the cat dies. Now we set up the experiment such that there's a 50% chance that the atom has decayed. Okay? So that means that there's a 50% chance that the hammer is dropped, and there's a 50% chance that the, the, the poison vial is smashed, and therefore there's a 50% chance that the cat is dead. But in quantum mechanics, it's not just a 50% chance. The atom is in a superposition of decayed and not decayed. Therefore, the hammer is in a superposition of dropped and not dropped. And therefore, the poison is in a superposition of smashed and not smashed. And the cat is in a superposition of alive and dead at the same time. Sounds kind of strange. So this is a thought experiment about measurement, because what if we open up this box? Well, the cat has to be alive or the cat has to be dead. Okay? So by opening the box, we either revive this half-dead, half-alive cat to life or we force it to die. So the act of looking in the box fundamentally changes the state of the cat. So measurement seems fundamentally asymmetric. It seems like this might be really the thing that gives us an arrow of time. Okay? We can sort of prepare things. We have some dynamics. This is that Schrodinger equation. I, I, sh I showed just to scare you away for a little bit. And then we measure it. We have this wave function collapse. This collapse introduces an asymmetry. That is, if you learn something, if you learn the cat is alive, can you somehow unlearn that? So the collapse has something to do with knowledge. All right. So let's do some experiments. This take a break from the introduction, and we'll go into my laboratory, which looks like this. We have lots of electronics and computers, and back here in the back, we have a dilution refrigerator. This dilution refrigerator we use to cool our samples down to temperatures that are just a hair's breadth above absolute zero, temperature about 10 millikelvin. So when you open it up, it has these beautiful gold-plated uh, stages. There's many layers of shielding, and if you look inside here, what we have is an aluminum box. That's half of the box. Another half that goes on top. And then sitting in this box is a little circuit. And all you need to know about the nitty gritty physics of these superconducting circuits and squids that we talked about in the introduction is that there are quantum energy levels. Just like the quantum energy level, the energy levels of an atom. There's a ground state, there's an excited state, there are other levels. But we'll just think about there being two energy levels. 
These two energy levels are, belong to the circuit which sits inside a box. Okay? So you, know, you don't have to think about the details of the experiment anymore because I'll give you an analogy that's very true to what the experiment is, but it's a little easier to think about. It's this quantum levels in a box. So imagine we have a box and there it has two shelves. These are the energy levels. There's the upper shelf, there's a lower shelf, and there's a ball. The ball represents the state of the circuit. The ball can be on the lower shelf or it can be on the upper shelf. So you can think about it as a, as a cabinet in your kitchen, but it's on the lower shelf or the upper shelf. Okay? For the experiments we'll do, the box is closed, but we have the ability to open it up at the end and look and see whether the ball's on the bottom shelf or the top shelf. Right? So let me tell you some of the peculiar rules that govern the behavior of this system. It's not particularly obvious, but there's only three things you need to remember, so it's quite simple. The first is, if I have this ball on the bottom shelf, and I send in a pulse of energy with just the right height and just the right length, I find that the ball, when I open up the, the, the box later on, always is on the top shelf. This pulse has just the right amount of energy to kick it to the top shelf, and it works every single time. Okay? So that's, that seems reasonable. That's the first rule we have. The second thing we find is that if the ball is on the top shelf, and I send in that same pulse of energy, it always goes to the bottom shelf. So a pulse of energy will take it to the top shelf, or it'll take it to the bottom shelf to the top shelf, or it'll take it from the top shelf to the bottom shelf. Okay. The final thing we observe is that if I send in a half a pulse, it doesn't have to have this funny shape. It's just that it has half of the area, so it's half as, half as high or half as long, but I send in half as much energy. We find that half of the time it's on the top shelf, and half of the time it's on the bottom shelf. Okay? It's not that I cut the ball in half and half of it's on top, half on the bottom. This is just my way to visually represent that 50% of the time it's on the top, and 50% of the time we find it to be on the bottom. So you might conclude that this half pulse has a 50% probability of exciting it to the top shelf. That just works half the time. Right? turns out what's going on is much, much deeper than that. It has to do with these quantum superpositions. And let me prove that to you by way of a counterexample. Okay? So let's assume that this is right, that it's really a 50% probability of exciting the ball to the top shelf. That is, it just works half the time. Well, what would happen then if we applied two half pulses? Let's think about it. We choose probabilities. The first one has a 50% chance of working, of getting it to the top shelf. And the second one has a 50% chance of getting it to the top shelf. Well, see, so the first one has a 50% chance of putting it on the top shelf. The second pulse, if it happens to be on the top shelf, it has a 50% chance of putting it on the bottom shelf. If it's on the bottom shelf, it has a 50% chance of putting it on the top shelf. Therefore, the second pulse should have no effect whatsoever. Does that make sense? There are four possible outcomes, and Two of those end up with on the bottom shelf, two of them end up with the, on the, the top shelf, and so the second pulse would have no effect if it was just the case that it was 50% probability. I need to see like at least like 10% of people nodding. Does that make sense? That seems like a fairly straightforward argument. Okay, turns out that's not what happens. What we find is that when we send in two half pulses, the ball always goes to the top shelf. What does that mean? It means that there has to be kind of some shelf in the middle. Maybe the first shelf, first pulse puts it on the sort of shel halfway shelf. Some sort of stable shelf that's in there that's not the top shelf, it's not the bottom shelf, but it's somewhere in between so it can remember that first pulse. When the second pulse comes in, it gets back all the way up to the top shelf. Kind of think about it like maybe as a ladder. It gets stuck. But half of the ladder, the second pulse brings it the rest of the way up. So we think there's some stable state that's both top and bottom at the same time. It turns out this is the superposition state in quantum mechanics. And this is how we know it's there, because you send in two of these pulses, it always works. That means there's something stable in the middle. It turns out if I put in a half pulse of negative amplitude, it doesn't really matter so much. I can get some other shelf here. This is the top shelf minus the bottom shelf. I could put in a one-quarter pulse. 
That means it would put me maybe a quarter away from the bottom shelf to the top shelf, or put in a three quarters pulse, or any possible things. There's infinitely many possible shelves, or infinitely many possible superposition states that can be made in the system. In quantum mechanics, we call this, describe this by a wave function, it's given by this fancy Greek letter psi. And it just says we can have any combination of top and bottom we want, and we can create those with different types of pulses. So that's a quantum superposition. And it's this experiment with two half pulses that allows us to know that that <laughs> quantum superposition is really there. So that's giving you a picture of superposition. But what happens when you open the box? Well, the ball's always on either on the top shelf or the bottom shelf. Those are the only real physical shelves that are there. We always find out one or the other. It's the same thing with the cat. The cat is either dead or alive. So opening the box, even though we had this superposition state, it destroys that superposition state, giving me the top shelf or the bottom shelf. This is something that troubled Einstein to no end. He says, God doesn't play dice with the universe. It was very troubling to him that when you open the box, you have this fundamentally random process where the ball has to be either on the top or the bottom. Turns out this is one of the cases where Einstein was wrong. So we've been talking about opening the box suddenly. What this does is it either kills the cat or brings it to life. But I wonder if we could do this in a more gentle way, in a more scientific way. If we could somehow peek in the box more carefully, would we understand what's going on in a deeper way? And that's exactly what we're going to do. Okay. So here's the experiment we want to do. We know that after we put in this half pulse, we have this specific superposition state. It's the top shelf and the bottom shelf at the same time. But if we open the box, we know that we don't know what shelf it'll be on. It'll be 50% chance of top, 50% chance of bottom. So what we're going to do is we're going to do an experiment where we cut a tiny hole in the box over here, and we shine a laser beam through the box, a very faint box, because laser beams are cool, and this is how you do good experiments. You use lasers. Okay, and on the other end, we have a detector, and the detector is going to count the photons that come through the box. So we're going to sort of peek in the box one photon at a time to sort of see how, what's going on. To understand how this measurement works, first I'll see what happens if I just start with the ball on the bottom shelf, okay, as shown here. So I send in light, what I find is the detector says, ah, I get three photons, two photons, one photon, one photon, five photons, four photons, zero photons. These are sort of how many photons I retrieve in a given interval of time, say in one second. So I got three photo photons per second, two photons per second, so forth and so on. So the first thing to notice is that the photon number that I detect is not perfectly constant. It's another peculiar feature of quantum mechanics. It arises because the photons don't interact with one another. So they don't know how to line up in a neat queue, one after another, and come in a steady stream. They end up coming at random times, and that gives me this random distribution of photons called shot noise. So the photons fundamentally, because they're quantum particles, arrive at different times. So we have this sort of fundamental uncertainty in how many photons they get at any, any given time. Uh, excuse me, can you yes. just explain what is a photon? What is a photon? A photon is a particle of light. So thank you for the question. Um, so this laser beam here, it is both a wave nature and a particle nature. We can think about it as a beam of things, but you can also think of it as a beam of individual particles of light. That are, that, are, that are traveling here. So it's the, it's the fact that light comes in quantized units, and those are photons. So that's what I'm counting. So here's, here's the distribution of detected photons, and here's the number of photons. Okay, so I see that I find on average three photons, but sometimes I get as many as five photons, and sometimes I get as few as zero photons. Okay, so there's a distribution, just like the distributions of grades in a class. Now, if I put the ball on the top shelf, I find in this case, if I do the experiment, I get five photons, four photons, two photons, one photon, six photons, eight photons, zero photons, six photons. I get more photons on average, but still I can get as few as three, and I can get as many as eight, and I get on average five. Okay, so you can think that what's happening is that the, when the ball is on the bottom shelf, it's blocking some of the light. When it's on the top shelf, the light goes through. 
So that's why we're seeing more photons on average, more lights coming through the box when the ball's on the top shelf. Sound good? Okay, so let's do the experiment. When we apply that half pulse, we create the superposition of top shelf and bottom shelf. And we send in the light, and we see how many photons we detect in the first one second, and we detect seven photons. Okay? So for reference, here's my distribution. This is what I get when it's on the bottom shelf. This is what I get when it's on the top shelf. So three photons on average, five photons on average. This is seven photons on average. Now let me ask you, given that we've detected seven photons, is it more likely we'll find the ball on the top shelf or the bottom shelf? Top shelf. It's intuitive, right? It's because it's more likely you'd get seven photons if it was on the top shelf. Therefore, it's more likely to be on the top shelf. That intuitive inference you made is something we owe to, well, we all I said intuitive, but uh, was first formalized by Thomas Bayes back in the 1700s. Bayes theorem. It says the probability of B, give, probability of A given B, is probability of B given A times the probability of A divided by the probability of B. It sounds like a bunch of A's and B's and so forth. But what we, you can think of it as if B is some new information, then it changes our odds of event A happening. Let me try to explain this to you by way of an analogy. Let's imagine that it's nighttime, okay? And we're in this room, and we're wondering whether or not the sun has suddenly undergone a supernova. It's not something we normally worry about, but you could think about worrying about it. Um, and so we want to know whether or not it's undergone a supernova, okay? And we have I happen to have a neutrino detector. It's right here. In reality, the neutrino detector that we have on Earth is called Ice Cube. It's a kilometer cube of ice in Antarctica. So it's a little bigger, a little uh, bigger than that, but this may be the future when we're more sensitive to neutrinos. But think about, okay, what is a neutrino? A neutrino is some fundamental particle that the sun gives off when it's burning. You can think of it that way. And neutrinos interact very weakly with matter. So when it's, uh, when we're, when the sun's in the sky, they come right through the roof of this building. When it's night, they come right through the bottom of Earth. And they zip right through us when we're sleeping. They zip right through us when we're out in the sun. Okay, so the sun, the neutrinos we can t tell are coming from the sun because they're always coming through the, the, the Earth. So even if it's night, we can tell the sun's burning by looking at the neutrino flux, the number of neutrinos we get. Okay, this detector can measure neutrinos. But it's a tricky detector. Because once it decides if the sun has gone supernova or not, it rolls two dice. And if they both come up sixes, it lies to us. Otherwise, it tells the truth, okay? So if it, so it measures something, it rolls the dice, it gets a five and a four, it tells the, two, the truth. It, can tell, it measures, it gives us two sixes, it lies to us, okay? So it's an unreliable detector, okay? So we do the experiment. Hey, has the sun gone supernova? Press the button, and the detector says, yes, sun has undergone a supernova. Bye-bye. <laughs> so because the detector is unreliable, we have to analyze this data, the yes answer, using probabilities, using statistics. Okay? So there's two ways to do this. You can use standard statistics. This is what we call frequentist statistics. This is what you learn in, I don't know, high school level things. This is what used to determine significance and so forth. Okay, you say, what is the probability of this result happening by chance? It's one in 36. That's 2.7%. Okay. That corresponds to a p-value less than 0 0.05. So I only get this joke if you know what a p-value is. That means it's a significant result. It's a really low probability that it's, it's, it's wrong by chance. Therefore, we should conclude that the sun has exploded with high confidence. Quick, let's publish this result before it's too late. <laughs> the Bayesian statistician, however, has done a different calculation and is quite confident that the sun has not undergone a supernova and is in fact so confident that he's willing to wager $50 on it. So what does Bayes' rule say about this problem? Well, it says the probability of a supernova, given the yes answer, that's what we know. What is the probability that the sun actually underwent a supernova, given the detector said yes, it's equal to the probability of a yes given a supernova. Well, that's something we know. That's the probability that the detector is not lying to us. 
is 35 over 36, it's 97%. Okay. And we multiply that by the probability of a supernova. What do you think is the probability of a supernova happening in a given night to our sun? Really small. I think it's about zero. Okay, so this is easy math. 97% times zero is equal to zero. So that's how Bayes' rule works. Very nice. But this applies also, coming back to our question of whether or not the bottle is on the top shelf or the bottom shelf, it tells us exactly how to calculate the probabilities based on how many photons we've detected. Right, it says the probability of the top, the bottom shelf, given n photons, is equal to the probability of the bottom shelf in the first place, that was 50%, times the probability of getting n photons given the bottom shelf. Well, that's exactly the distribution here that we, we measured, similarly for the top shelf. Okay, so this exactly plugs into Bayes' rule and allows us to calculate how the probabilities change as we accumulate information by detecting photons. Okay, so let's, let's look at, I, so there's the promise of quantum movies. This is maybe as close as we get to it. So don't be too disappointed. I'm gonna simplify this a little bit. I'm just gonna have an arrow point to where the ball is. So if it's pointing straight up, that's corresponding to the top shelf, it's pointing straight down, that corresponds to the bottom shelf. And if it points over here on the side, that corresponds to that superposition state, top shelf plus bottom shelf. Okay? So this is just kind of a simpler way to look at it. Now let's think about what the detector says. So it said six photons at first. That means it's more likely to be on the top shelf, so it shifts up a little bit. Then we detect the zero photons. Well, that means it's actually more likely to be on the bottom shelf, so it shifts down a little bit. Then we detect three photons, or four photons. It means actually we, we didn't really learn anything. It's back to where it started. Going five photons, four photons, nine photons, two photons. You can see this is wiggling up and down until maybe eventually we become quite confident that it's on the top shelf. Okay? So that's a quantum movie of how the state of the ball changes as we accumulate information. The state is our state of knowledge. It's what do we know given what we've measured. Okay? This time evolution, this movie I played you, is what we call a quantum trajectory. Okay? It's a quantum trajectory of how the, the ball goes from being in the superposition state to being on the top shelf. I'm able now to open up the box very slowly just by shining in my laser and sort of take a movie of how the wave function collapses. This is something we actually can do in the lab. So here's some real data showing exactly that. So each color trace is a different quantum trajectory that we've measured. So here it starts off with the ball on the top shelf and the bottom shelf at the same time. And this green trajectory goes up, jiggles around and eventually goes up to be highly likely to be on the top shelf. Another one here, the, the, say the purple one, goes down and it's up on the bottom shelf. This overall grayscale in the back is just the sort of overall distribution. So you can see half the time it goes to the top, half the time it goes to the bottom. Sometimes it takes some time to get there in the middle. So this blue one sort of takes a long time for the photons or the system to be collapsed onto one state or the other. The measurement goes on and on. It's hard to really determine whether it's on the top shelf or the bottom shelf. And therefore, the probability sort of slowly stays around 50%. So those are my movies of wave function collapse, which is something we can access in the, in the laboratory. Now, we're, the purpose of this talk was not just to talk about wave function collapse, but it was to look at the arrow of time. So let's get back to that main task. Okay. So the first thing I want to talk about is that we can see something called measurement reversal. We saw this in my, my schematic here, right? It starts off pointing at the top shelf and the bottom shelf, pointing to the side. It goes up, it goes down, it goes back to where it started. I can reverse that. It would go down, it would go up, and it would go back to where it started. So, so the measurement can reverse itself, come back to the initial condition. Measure reversal. And this is something that's been observed in, in actually several experiments. And you can actually see this in experimental data as well. Right here, this blue trace goes up, then it goes down, and then it goes up, and then back here, it's back where it started. So we've measured it for all this time, and it's back to where it started. So the fact that the wave function can kind of collapse and then uncollapse indicates that there's some amount of reversibility going on in the measurement process. That this measurement itself is reversible, just like the equations of motions are. Okay, so let's look at it a little more precisely. Here's 
uh, just a, a graphical representation of that. Here's the, the number of photons as a function of time, and here's the state. So this probability of being the top self or the bottom self. There's a single trajectory. If I want to reverse it, that's possible. So the reverse process would start up here in the top self, and I would need to, in order to have that reverse, I would need the measurement record to be the reverse of this and flipped upside down. So the condition for reversal is that the record of photons, you could think of it as the soundtrack to the movie, is upside down and backwards. And if I feed this the upside down and backwards trajectory, this thing does exactly the opposite of that, and it reverses exactly to where this one started. Okay? And this is this just a completely analogous to what one has to do to reverse classical equation motions. You send time to minus time, you run it backwards, and you flip the moment, the direction of the momentum. Okay, so it's possible to reverse wave function collapse. That's the point I want to make. So the idea that it's irreversible, that's no longer necessarily the case. Okay. So let's go back to this game where we want to guess which way the movie is playing. Can we guess which way these quantum movies are playing? Right? So what we want to know is what is the probability that a given movie is going forward in time given the, the, the record of photons I've detected? Okay, so to do this, I need to explain just a little more detail in terms of how to, how to think about probabilities in this case. So we're getting kind of deep into this. Okay, so when I start off with the ball on the top shelf and the bottom shelf at the same time, then the probability of detecting a, single, a certain number of photons is a combination of this distribution, which is what I would get if it was on the bottom shelf, and the red distribution, which is what I would get if it was on the top shelf. Okay? So for simplicity, I'll just combine those two, add those two, I get one Gaussian of slightly larger width. Okay? If I detect this first photon, that photon occurs with a certain probability density. Right? It's not the most probable thing that could happen, but it's not impossibly unlikely. It happens with some probability. This detection of photons, as we already understood through Bayes' theorem, means that now the ball is more likely to be on the top shelf. So this vector changes, the state changes, Okay? But now that it's more in the top shelf than the bottom shelf, the distribution of these distributions, or the sum of the, weight, the weighting in these two distributions, changes. Which means that this distribution is going to shift over when I add these two. Okay? So that causes the distribution to shift over. Now if I go back and I detect a zero, zero photons, that happens with a different probability. So the first point I want to make is just like, what is the probability of getting 10 heads in a row? You just multiply the probabilities together, a half times a half times a half times a half. 10 times. Here, if we want to know the probability of a certain trajectory, we just multiply these probabilities. Probably the first detection, probably the second one, probably the third one. But those depend on the state because that causes this, this histogram to move around. So here's an example of a, a somewhat likely trajectory. Okay. So we start off in this state here. We detect this number of photons. That's the mo not the most likely thing to happen, but it's, it's not incredibly unlikely. That means it's more likely to be on the top shelf. Therefore, the distribution shifts over. And now, if we detect just the most likely value, that reinforces what we already learned, causing the ball to be even more likely to be on the top shelf, causing the distribution to shift over even further. Then if we detect the most likely value, it's even more likely to be on the top shelf, and so forth and so on. So that's a likely trajectory, one where it goes from being on the top shelf and the bottom shelf to being on top shelf. Or it could go the other way with full probability. An unlikely trajectory is actually the reverse, reverse of that. In order for this, the ball from, to go from being almost certainly on the top shelf to being in this equal superposition, I have to kind of undo all this knowledge that ha I have. Okay, so the distributions over here, the first detection event has to happen with relatively low probability, causing it to move down slightly, causing the distribution to move over, <coughs> Again, I detect something with fairly low probability, causing it to move over, move down, and move over. So I can think that the reverse process is actually going to be less likely than the forward process. And this reminds me of our discussion of entropy at the beginning of the talk. Right? There's more ways for it to be messy. There's only one way for it to be clean. We can see it's more probabilistic for it to go one way, the movie to play one way. It's less probable for it to play backwards. We're looking at the same idea. So we're also looking at 
in some sense, entropy associated with the me quantum measurement. Okay, so if I actually put real numbers to this, um, I take a certain record here, and I define sort of, cert this strictly speaking, it's a probability density I'm talking about, but I'll just talk about it as a probability. If I just multiply together all these probabilities, I get some really certainly unlikely probability, 10 to the minus 300. Okay, it's not very likely, but let's compare that to the probability of the reverse process, the movie playing backwards. Okay, in this case, in order for it to go backwards, I have to get sort of the wrong number of photons. I have to kind of disagree with what I already knew. And this trajectory occurs with a probability of 10 to the minus 310. So they're both are incredibly unlikely by themselves, but the backwards one is 10 to the 10 times less likely than the forward one. Okay? So if I was gonna, if I was you know, a betting man, I would say, oh, I'm pretty sure this top one is the forward one, path one, and this bottom one is the backward one. Because I can tell just by looking at the probabilities. Okay, so here's the, the one like real piece of data that I'll show you in this talk, We're almost at the end. We did this experiment some many number of thousands of times, 10,000 or something. And I measured did many of these quantum movies, and for each of these movies, we determined the forward probability, and we determined the backward probability, and what I'm plotting for you is a histogram of the ratio, of the logarithm of the ratio of the two. So this is forward divided by backward, okay? And I'm taking the log of that. So if the forward probability is greater than the backward probability, the logarithm will be positive. That's what I'm showing in blue here. So all the blue ones are cases where the forward movie is more likely than the backward movie. Okay? You'll note that there's these red ones here where the logarithm is negative, which means that the backward probability is actually larger than the forward probability. Those are cases where it was more likely that the movie was playing backwards. Okay. It's kind of surprising. So you can see that on average, if I just take the average of all of this, it's clearly more likely that the movies will play forward than backward. That's a statistical arrow of time. The movies in general are more likely to go forward than they are to go backward. But just like I told you the second law of thermodynamics was a rule of thumb, entropy sort of always increases. What we find here is that the movies sort of always are more likely to be playing forwards, but sometimes they actually seem to be playing backwards. That, that in some sense, if you want to be really provocative, you say the time seems to flow backwards at those times. Right? Entropy is decreasing. This is actually something that has to happen according to various uh, equations and so forth and so on. So that's what we find. We see that on average, the movies are more likely to be playing forward than backward. So let's summarize what I've told you. The first point I want to make is that classical physics is time reversible. That is, those movies of the billiard balls hitting, hitting one another. We have a quick question? Yeah. Go ahead. If the light source is continuous, can you hear me? Yeah, the light source is continuous. Why is there a distribution of photons? So this is a, a kind of a subtle issue. It's a continuous light source. The idea is that the photons, they don't interact with one another. Okay? So if I think about a given period of time or space, I put a photon, it goes anywhere randomly in that period of space. And I put lots of photons in, I end up with them randomly distributed. It's just a fundamental property of light, but it has to do with the fact that the photons they don't interact with one another, they just get randomly put in different things, so the intensity is not perfectly constant. It's also a manifestation of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It's one of these sort of funny quantum features. So you have to take it at face value for now, I think. Hold on, let me, let me wrap up and then we'll do questions. You don't mind. So we, we saw that classical physics is time reversible, except, or but, we can tell the past and the future as the system transitions from order to disorder. This is that second law of thermodynamics, okay? I told you that quantum physics is time reversible. That is that quant the, the Schrodinger equation equally well runs forwards as it does backwards. Mm -hmm. Except when it's not, except for in this wave function collapse situation where buildings are collapsing and so forth, right? Wave function collapse is fundamental adds, it fundamentally adds in a time sim asymmetry. But then I told you that quantum measurement can also be reversible. That if we do these measurements not just abruptly like this, but slowly, 
and continuously, those measurement dynamics can be reversed. Okay, so quantum measurements can be reversed. But we can still tell the arrow of time. But this time, as a transition from disorder to order, that is, as we learn more about the system. Okay, in, this, in one case, it's order to disorder. We're like things spreading it out. In this case, it's disorder. We don't know what shelf is on to order when we do know what shelf is on. So there's sort of a, a, a similarity between classical and quantum physics, but there's also a, a dissimilarity in terms of which way order is going. So with that, I'll return to Janice, who's looking forward to the future or backwards at the past, thinking about measurements running backwards in time versus forwards in time, and uh, again, acknowledge Andrew Jordan and my research group at Washington University. So thank you for your time. Can, can we say that uh, time is uh, neither forward or reverse, but it is cyclical? So it is, it is, it is never ever one way. It is cyclical. It goes forward and reverse at the same time always. So yeah, the question is: Is time forward or backward or cyclical, or does it just exist? Um, and I think I, I don't have a, a strong opinion on that matter. In general relativity, we have time and space are sort of the same thing. You say it together, space time, and just as space has sort of, can think about right and left, time you can think about forward and future and past. So it's still surprising that we seem to experience time for the most part going forward, that clocks run forward. When you do the experiments, they start and end using clocks. Uh, here we're trying to understand sort of the physics you can, the questions you can ask about why does it go forward? Why does it appear to go forward? But I think it's, it, I, I don't think we can claim that it goes one way or the other if it's cyclical or always existing. So I think we still leave that for the philosophers. Well, well, hi. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I really like how you went into the Bayesian part of it. So I'm wondering, what do you call the quantum trajectory, right? Yes. So is that is that a trajectory of a physical state, or is that just a trajectory of the state in the observer's mind? Okay. The question is, is that a trajectory of the physical state, or is that a trajectory of the state, our state of knowledge? Right. It's a trajectory of our state of knowledge. The the idea of a physical state versus a state of knowledge is a highly contested and philosophical aspect of quantum mechanics. Um, so. For many people, that state of knowledge is also considered to be the physical state. Okay? But in this case, it's really, I think, in almost all experimental contexts, it, thinks, it makes pays to think of it, or makes most sense to think about states of knowledge. That's what we have to, to work with in the future. So my definition of the state when I talk about quantum trajectories is a state of knowledge. Are, are you speaking in an interpretation there, or is that not the I think it's, I think it's, um, I don't attend to sneak in an interpretation there, because really this is about what can I predict given what I know. So I think this is fairly uh, free of interpretation. This is very much a practical definition of the state. But I, I love to, to get in debates about interpretations. Actually, uh, hello. Yes. Is it possible to um, do a concise definition of a time or concept of time? Give a concise definition of time. time or concept of time. Or concept. Two different examples. You are clarifying your concept of time. Clarify my concept of different experiments. Yes. Now, I would like to know, could it not be possible to carry out experiment without massive substance to bring out the clear concept of electron or clear concept of time? OK, so the, I think the question is, um, the, so, so when the, there's a practical definition of time for the laboratory, which is what my clocks <coughs> when I measure things, and that's what how I measure time and so forth and so on. Another definition one might go with has to do with entropy increase. So when I said if you want to be really provocative, you can think time sort of runs backwards. That is, entropy is decreasing then you can define time in a different way that's more uh, naturally suited to how quickly you're accumulating knowledge about some system. So I think in my sense, 
in my experiments, time is what ticks off in the clock in my lab. And I'm just looking at probabilities whether the movies are more likely to be going forward and backwards. Uh, your second question about if you could do experiments without electrons. No, without mass. Without mass. Not with electrons, without massive substance. Without massive substance to learn something. Um, you can certainly do experiments with that with photons. Photons are massless particles. But as we know from special relativity, mass and energy are equivalent. And so if you're using energy, then in some sense there's an equivalence to mass. So I don't know if it makes sense to come up to create experiments without a massive substance. So you explained that forward and backward motion in some area. I would you explain some portion of the forward and backward movement relating to time and other, that's so different. I put it in my way to understand myself. Imagine the shaft, the metallic shaft, uh -huh. say about uh, 20 or 30 centimeters in dia. Okay. So, dia, diameter, is rotating at 10 RPM or rather at the water it may be. When it is rotating, the outer periphery is rotating relating to the center. Yeah. When it think about the absolute center, whether it is rotating or stable. Similarly, the solid ball, okay. in center, we can measure the distance and so on. Again, the absolute center only turns on. All right, yes, so I think the question is, let's say if I spin in the circle here, is the very center of me moving or is it stationary? Is that here, right? And it's, it's moving, I mean, it, 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 yeah, so you can define that it's still moving. The center of some rotating bar is, is still moving, it's still rotating. So, it's not stationary. So, um, and there's a way to formalize that, but I think that's, yeah. So, so before the next question, uh, one from uh, somebody above. Uh, given enough time, millions of millions of years, is there a probability for the glass to come back to a broken state? <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay, wonderful question. So, given a long enough time, will the glass actually go back to its unbroken state? This is about something called the Poincaré recurrence theorem. Okay? So if you have a very small thing, like a billiards table, and you have a few particles, you can see this. You let the particle go long enough, eventually it will get back to where it started. You put two particles in, and you let it go, eventually those come back to where they started. Okay? And so the glass, or when I drop a water bottle on the floor, it's down there. Eventually, it will jump back up into my hand. Okay? At some point, all of the vibrations in the floor and the water and the plastic and so forth will happen to line up in such a way that it will jump right back up into my hand. That time is a very, very long time. <laughs> so m many more than billions of years, much longer than we'd ever have before tea. Um, but, but in some sense, that should happen in principle. Yes, Quite a great question. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, once we have a proposed theory for uh, quantum gravity, so what would be the implication of this time moving in the backwards in that uh, framework? Okay, wonderful question. So what might this imply for quantum gravity? So one of the most interesting challenges for physics now is understanding how gravity fits in there with the rest of physics. How does it fit in with quantum mechanics? And the, the, the thought is that there'll be a theory of quantum gravity that ties it together. Um, and what might this say for, for quantum gravity? There's a connection. I'm not quite sure what it is, but this sort of forward-backward um, aspect is one area where quantum gravity theorists are thinking about things. So this idea is that black holes, you know, if matter going in, they can actually tunnel to a state where matter goes out. They turn into a white hole, okay? So that's the time reverse of the black hole going forward. Okay, those are two different things that can happen, and you can think about switching from one to the other. So that definitely involves this sort of reversibility or time reversal uh, ideas. So it's possible that some of the ideas here, especially having to do with running things backwards in time, those are going to be useful ideas for thinking about quantum gravity. So we're not sure where it'll go, but that's, it's possible that it could be exciting. So Mike, somebody has yeah, so there is uh, another experiment in quantum mechanics where uh, they study about the interference of electrons to two holes. Yes. So, uh, yeah, we all know that interference pattern, but uh, like when they go to detect with the photon detector, then we find that the wave function of the electron collapses and it's like 
through one hole only. Like they cannot study the actual interference pattern. They see just one Gaussian uh, through like one hole of the other hole. And uh, the scientists explain it later that it is because that uh, the photon interacts with the electron so as to collapse the this uh, its state. So here also you are using photons uh, to detect the particles. So how do you make sure that it is like going to the top or the bottom? It doesn't interfere with the state. The photon doesn't interfere with the state of the electron as well. Here yes. as well, how I mean, like, how are you making sure that the experiment is going smoothly? Yes. Okay. What well, interesting question. Um, so there's the the classic example of a double slit experiment or even the enforcement of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. If you try to measure where something is with photons, the photons bump it around and they disturb its momentum and then you don't know where it is later on. It's the same sort of idea. In this case, how, how can we think about how the photons are disturbing the ball? Okay, do they push it around? Do they cause something else to go on? And yeah, they do. Okay. It turns out there's a very fun, subtle issue. There's the, the way that the photons or the, the inter interact with the electrons and so forth is what we call back action. It's, it's, you're trying to measure something, but it's affecting it. And there's two types of back action that can happen here. One is purely associated with the information. So you don't have to think about a physical disturbance. The change in the wave function that we have here is just a state of knowledge changes in the wave function. So there doesn't have to be an interaction that pushes things around, although that probably also is taking place but it's possible to set up a situation where there's only information accumulated. So the disturbance is really due to information. It's called spooky back action. So that's certainly something that, that happens and, and you can think about, but it's not necessary. You showed two plots, actually. Uh, one was with respect to the number of detected photons. With respect yes. to what was the x-axis there, like the light um, frequency, amount of intensity of light or the, uh, with respect to time? So the, you're thinking about these distributions, like these ones? Uh, the before one, the, before you sh showed. Earlier in the talk? Yeah. When I showed like these two distributions earlier? Yeah. This? No. Sorry. Okay. So earlier stuff? Earlier. Yeah. The next thing. This? Two plots, like, two slides. Yeah, this one. This one, yeah. yeah. So this is, yeah, this is like um, number of detected photons. This is, this is, yeah, so this is the number of detected photons. And this is the number of times I detected that number of photons. So this is poorly labeled. So I apologize for that. So, so this is, so here I got numbers, right? This is zero photons, one photon, two photons, three photons. And this is probability of detecting three photons. Okay? So if I, had a, if, I had, if I did the experiment where I end up with this many things, this will be a number of times I detected that number of photons. The plot which you showed afterwards is the same, right? The probability versus the number of photons. Plot. Yeah. All of these ones are probability versus number. Uh, yeah. The same plot yeah. that you showed a number of lights afterwards is the same as this plot. Yeah, it's the same. Okay, so every time it was just the probability of detecting a certain number of photons versus that number. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, for the interest. Thank you for the talk. And uh, uh, you said that uh, when we set two half pulses of energy, uh, it, there are uh, there are chances of uh, uh, once once you said that. Uh, there are half chances of a 50% probability of going it up uh -huh. and down. So can we just open the box and set those two half pulses so that we can see what is the stable position between the top and the bottom? Yeah. So this this is the this is the very That's that's a wonderful question. So can we just open the box to see that stable thing? Can we send, send the pulses while we're opening the box? The idea is that the opening the box or the measurement destroys that superposition state, collapsing it to the top or the bottom. So as long as you have it open, 
the pulses will have no effect, or they'll be 50, they'll have a, they'll, they'll be, this, it will not be the case that two half pulses equals a whole. It's only when you're not looking that the superposition state can exist. So that's what, that's the kind of spooky aspect, aspect of measurement, is in quantum mechanics, it matters if you're looking. You get different, different effects. Question? That goes with the Thank you, Professor, for the interesting talk. I'm a student of biology. I have a similar kind of question. So what is the role of the conscious observer in the function, wave function collapse? <laughs> so do we have a role? Like, and is it like only the conscious observation affects the uh, wave function or like any observation? Because any observation, I, I cannot make sense out of it. So what is the role of the conscious observer in the role in wave function collapse? Again, another debated topic in, in measurement. I don't think the consciousness of the observer matters at all. So you know, my detector measures the photons. It's not that I looked at the photon number to determine what happened. It's that there was a correlation established between the detectors and the, 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 the quantum system. Okay. Now, so, so the consciousness is not important here, and I think that's an important aspect to, to keep in mind. So the Schrodinger's cat, well, let's not talk about Schrodinger's cat. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's just a matter of, of correlations, the relationships between things. And the, one of the, the, the strange questions is where do you draw the line between two quantum things being entangled, for some people who know about that language, um, versus the wave function being collapsed in an indefinite state. How, how big does the observer have to be? Does it have to be one other photon? Does it have to be 10 photons? Does it have to be a detector with an Avogadro's number of photons? Or does it have to be a human? We don't really know where that line is, but I, we, we think it's somewhere between 10 photons and the detector that has an Avogadro's number of photons. So, next question. Okay. Uh, so, uh, considering a system in the state of maximum entropy, uh, what can we tell about the uh, arrow of time for that? Considering a system in a state of maximum entropy, what can you tell about the arrow of time? <coughs> so, depend, uh, so for our quantum system, a, a state of maximum entropy is a mixed state, one where we know nothing about the state. Okay, so if, if we measure it, we will actually learn information and we will see, we'll, we'll, we'll see the same sort of thing, thing of cases. Uh, applies. For a classical system, a, a system of maximum entropy, I think if you look at it, you will not be able to tell the movie going forward versus backwards. It's my intuition. So my, my answer is that you won't be able to tell an arrow of time if you're in a maximum entropy, entropy state. But the subtlety in quantum mechanics is you can tell, in some sense, entropy associated with the accumulation of information. So a maximum entropy system, we can still measure it and we can learn information, which in some sense, um, gives us an arrow of time. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the talk. Uh, uh, this, is, this is the time when you were trying to establish the time diversity of uh, quantum measurements. Yes. Uh, when you were sending photons, the measurements that you were taking, how many photons that you measure at each uh, instant, you went forward in time and uh, forward in the films that you showed. When you go backwards in time, would it, wouldn't it be just a thought experiment that you are going back in time in that sense? Would a quantum measurement really be reversible if you are doing the same experiment, the same number of slides another time? Like, would it go in the opposite direction in time if you are doing it some other time, maybe one year later? Yeah, I think I understand your question. So, the, indeed, in our experiments, we think with the, the the playing the movie backwards versus forwards is a thought experiment. We can analyze it. What would it look like if it was going backwards? What would it look like if it was going forwards? However, the point I wanted to make with the measurement reversibility is that the backwards trajectory is physically allowable. So if I start it in that final condition where it's up near the top shelf, and I do enough experiments, I'll eventually find a trajectory that matches the one I measured where it started at the the superposition state went forward. So those trajectories will occur. They're physically allowable. And so we can actually look in the experiment and look for those trajectories, ones that seem to be going backward in time. So that's, so it's a thought experiment when I compare the two probabilities, but we do see those trajectories because they are allowed, physically allowed. Okay, 
Is somebody on this side has a mic? Yeah. Uh, my question is that uh, when we do combinatorics uh, to give a meaning of entropy, that uh, if we count how many ways backward system or how many ways uh, forward system can be made by by the help of combinatorics, that will make a asymmetry. I mean, that is uh, that is normal essence of entropy. I mean. The way I can, uh, I mean, uh, can make my room dirty yeah. is many more ways yes. than to clean my room. That's the thing. Yeah. But uh, in quantum system that you have said, uh, how this combinatorics picture, by this combinatorics picture, can I make this asymmetry or it is not clear in that combinatorics picture to me. Yeah. So in, in the quantum picture, so the question is, when you think about Entropy in the classical sense, we count the number of different ways the room can be dirty. That's how we quantify the entropy. Uh, what's going on in the quantum case is, so the connection is that the probability of any given um, you know, messy state is the number of different ways, total different number of ways the room can be. One clean way, you know, 100 different messy ways. Okay, the probability of being messy is 99 or 100 over 101. Okay, so then we're thinking about the probability. This, that's what we're looking at in the quantum case. We're thinking about what is the probability of a trajectory. So I don't, there's actually an infinite number of trajectories, so it doesn't make sense to quantify how many different ways I can get this trajectory versus the other one, but I can quantify the probability density, and that's what I'm thinking about. And there's a con straightforward connection between probability density or probability and the number of ways. That's the connection we're using to, to think about entropy in this case. Is it possible for the ball not to go from the middle state to either the top or the bottom? Is it possible for the ball not to go from the middle state to either the top or the bottom? Um, well, if you just put in the half poles and you wait, it's just staying there. It'll stay in that middle thing, middle shelf, the top and bottom shelf at the same time, as long as nothing goes wrong. Okay. But once you open the box, it will always go to the top or the bottom shelf. Because when you open the box, you're, you know, in more technical terms, you're observing it in the basis of is it on the top or the bottom. It has those two choices. Those are the sort of two physically allowable states. We have to get one of those. So it can't just float. But can we watch it float? Sort of. Right? These trajectories, some of these trajectories I showed you, maybe I can get to them relatively quickly. Um, they appear to float in the middle, right? Here's exactly that. We know it's, we know it's on that, top, that middle shelf. We don't have to open the box because we set it up in that state with that first pulse. And then we're sort of watching it float. It's kind of jiggling up and down. And eventually it floats up to the top, the top shelf. But there we are, we're, we're observing it and it's still in the superposition of states. That's what's kind of amazing here. Is that we can actually, we can actually, we, we can do what you want to do. We can look at it at that middle shelf. It's not as satisfying as like, oh my gosh, there's the ball floating in midair. Of course, that's not even what our system is. But, but it's essentially that. We're able to measure it and have it still be in that superposition state. Because we're measuring it so weakly that we don't disturb it so much. These measurements are just a sequence of random variables, x1, x1. What do you write? Uh, the sufficient statistic is just the sample mean that you can take uh, for the measurements, right? So when you say going back in time, uh, if, if these uh, random variables are sufficiently independent, then you're going to converge to the uh, individual random variables mean. So, uh, so are you saying that when you're going back in uh, time, when the measurement trajectory is going back in time, it just means that the random variables are not uh, sufficiently independent, and that's what uh, Makes this uh, measurement Yeah. So I think I think you're, so. The question is, um, is it just that they're? Let me, let me know if I get the right. Uh, the, I just the right point. Is it just that the, the measurements are, are random? The point I want to make is they're they're not they're okay. The the measurement results are two things. Their mean value, the center of the distribution shifts. It depends on whether the ball's on the top shelf or the bottom shelf. Okay, so there's a, they have a mean that th that's correlated with the state of the ball, and then on top of that, there's a, a purely random term. Okay, it's not like a mean is constant with respect to the state of the ball. So the mean the mean shifts as the state of the ball shifts. 
And that's the origin of the asymmetry between forward and backward. So there's, because there's, there's a given mean for a given state of the ball. There's a given mean for a given state of the ball. Yeah, so, uh, so you can think about the, 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 the tech number of photons. The signal we measure is the state of the ball in some units plus noise. So it's noisy distribution that shifts around as the state of the ball moves. And so that gives the asymmetry when we go forward versus backwards. So when you take the sample mean, it has uh, to be So, so uh, actually, I think maybe it's a bit too technical, sample mean and uh, sufficient statistics and so on. Maybe we can discuss it <laughs> we can discuss blackboard. Afterwards. I think it would be much better to discuss it over blackboard. And, uh, Sir, uh, is space-time fundamental, or is it made of something even more fundamental, and that might give the direction of time? Sorry, can you repeat that question? Is space-time fundamental, or is it made of something even more fundamental that we don't know, is that might give the direction of time? Is space-time fundamental, or is it made of something even more fundamental that we don't know? I don't know. <laughs> it's a fun question, but I... Um, in general, relativity is fundamental. It's the geometry of space. Uh, could it be made of something else? Well, I don't, maybe. That's, that's, that's the thing we want to understand with quantum gravity, which is not really my area of expertise. So my answer will be, I don't know. Thank you. Uh, I have heard of something. Over this side. <laughs> I've heard of something known as the weak measurement. Uh, is this similar to what you did, or is it different? From yes, OK. Weak me is this weak measurement? Yes. This is exactly what weak measurement is. There are. There's something called weak values, and there are aspects of weak measurement that involve post-selection, and very funny and really interesting things happen. But this is weak measurement. The fact that we can watch this ball floating in the superposition state is because we're measuring it weakly. If we measured it strongly, it would collapse. So this is exactly enabled by weak measurement. Exactly. Brilliant job. Where did it live? Close over. I have a question. So, would it be right to say that the uh, macroscopic uh, error of time is somehow connected to quantum decoherence and our inability to really track all these trajectories? Of your so, would it be correct to say that our macroscopic error of time is somehow related to decoherence and these trajectories? Maybe. I, I wouldn't. I, it's, I think it's still a very thorny issue. Um, but I think that there's probably some connection there. Uh, and a lot, a lot of people have worked on that connection in many different ways. So I think there's a very strong connection there. Um, so I, I think it's safe to say that that's part of it. So yeah, thank you. Hello, Kato. Yeah. Thank you for the talk. Correct me if I'm wrong. From what I've read, they say faster we move, slower the time ticks. Yes. As we approach the speed of light, time continues to slow down. Yes. At the speed of light, time stops. So now let's just consider a photon, which is emitted by a star, which is say billions of light years away from Earth, basically on the other side of the universe. Yeah. Uh, so is it true that the photon, which takes billions of light years to reach my eye, but for that photon, it's instantaneous. You know, it's emitted, bam, it's in my eye. Is that true? Is it instantaneous? What, what I want to know is, does the photon experience that time delay of billions of years? Or, because we know that at the speed of light, time stops. So that means the photon should not experience any kind of time. So what's your opinion on that? Oh, gosh, that's a, <laughs> um, that's a nice question. The, so photons are, are a little funny because they don't have any mass. And so the, they're allowed to move at the speed of light, unlike massive things. I haven't really thought very, so someone who's probably taken a special relativity course maybe has a better answer than I, I haven't thought about this in a while. But photons take some time to go from point A to point B. When I shine my laser over here and press the button, it takes you know, the distance divided by the speed of light to get there. Okay, so the photon doesn't get there instantaneously, it travels at the speed of light. So. Um, so, sorry, uh, no, no follow-ups, please. There's lots of questions. So, <laughs> um, yeah. 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 So, sorry. I mean, I know. Sorry. sorry. So, just saying that, uh, like, uh, the big measurement is going on, and uh, so, like the ball is uh, so confused that where it wants to go. Like, so when, uh, like, uh, in the that chart, let's say, uh, uh, when the blue peak is still like it's. it's 
Yeah, it's downwards. Uh, that one will be just like uh, do a strong measurement and open the box. Will it be like in, in the uh, lower shape or the upper shape? Okay, so yeah, the question is, so here it is going along. Um, if at this point, will it be in the lower shelf or the tougher shelf? Well, this is the probability. So right there, that, I would say it's like yeah, maybe a 30% probability to be in the top shelf, so 70% chance that it's the bottom shelf. Okay, so if I open up the box, well, it might be on the top shelf, it might be on the bottom shelf. If I manage to do the experiment so, you know, 100 times where I get to the same point and I open up the box, 30 times it'll be on the top, 30 times it'll be on the bottom. That's exactly what we mean by this, and that's exactly what we see. So only when it's really on the edge is it going to definitely be found on the bottom shelf. Only when it's really on the top, it's definitely going to be on the top shelf. In between, <coughs> there's still some uncertainty. It's still longer 50% chance, but it's now 30-70. So it's changed the odds. Yeah. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. Uh, my question is, I'm trying to understand the last graph that you showed. Yeah. Uh, where there is a possibility of uh, time reversal. Yeah. Right? Uh, so I wanted to know, are there real life situations where uh, an in event can go back in time? Yes. So, I mean, are there real life situations where entropy decreases? Yes. yes. And that's something that has to happen. And this happens much more so on the tiny, 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 tiny scale. Okay, but this is something that one can, can observe and so forth that there are fluctuations and sometimes things reverse. Just as we discussed with the water bottle, you know, jumping up out of the floor and up in the hand, that's a very unlikely, very entropy reducing thing. Okay? If the glass becoming unbroke, it's physically possible. It's gonna happen very, very rarely, but it corresponds to sort of one of these cases here. Okay. So that does happen. Thank you. Okay, good evening, sir. So my question is that when we can't guarantee the position of the particle, right, until and unless we measure it, and when we measure it, we change or alter the properties. So does it have to do something with the reality? Like if we measure it, the reality changes or it exists anyways? If we measure it or not measure it, I mean, our consciousness has to do nothing with the reality that we see, or by measuring it, we alter the properties of the particle. So, I think the question is, I think maybe the essence of your question is, um, so well, one thing is true. If we measure it, we alter the properties. We collapse the wave function. Now, you mentioned, what about reality and so forth? So one, uh, one of the most widely views of wave function collapse and quantum mechanics is the many worlds theory. So this maybe gets to your idea of reality and so forth. Some people feel that if you start with this, this ball on the top shelf and the bottom shelf at the same time, the middle shelf, and you open the thing, you suddenly create two worlds, one in which is on the bottom shelf, one in which is on the top shelf. And yes. some people argue that that's really the only logical explanation for what's going on. <coughs> you can take, take that or leave it. So that there's sort of the sense of like, we're in one reality where it ends up on the top, there's another reality where it ends up on the bottom. It's a little more awkward with these weak measurements because now it's sort of floating around. There's like this continuous, infinite number of different realities where it's floated up a little bit, floated down a little bit. It starts to become sort of cumbersome. Um, but that's, uh, according to the surveys, that's the most. Is there a possibility of a multiverse? Sorry, uh, sorry uh, can, can we not have dialogues? Oh, There's already way too many Hi, questions. Thank you, sir. We can ask thank you after. OK. Uh, so there is, no. Uh, there is at least eight or nine different people I know who have been raising hands for quite some time, but we have to stop at some point for tea. Uh, time. Okay. Uh, so we'll take two more questions and then we'll stop. And please, apologies, but there's only so much time here. So uh, two, two last questions. Uh, um, I just wanted to point out that there is a uh, kind of hierarchy of collapse times, for example, in this exam uh, with your experiment. Yes. The, the state of the photon collapses much faster compared to the uh, state of your uh, qubit, let us say. Yes. And um, uh, then one can have something else which uh, observes this uh, collapse of this photon state, which collapses even faster. Yes, yes. So, absolutely. That's, that's a very nice comment. Um, that there's a hierarchy of time scales. The, the photon is also a quantum thing. 
Right? So the photon goes through the box. It's actually the case that the photon is entangled with the state of the ball. And then we detect the photon, and that collapses the photon state to either being there or not being there, and so forth and so on. And in this measurement context, I'm completely ignoring the wave collapse of the, the wave measurement of the photon. I assume that's really fast and really instantaneous and a very sort of classical projective measurement. And I'm using that to learn about the, the very weak measurement interaction the photon made with the ball. So it's a, yeah, it's important to sort of note that. And we're just sort of focusing on one problem by ignoring the other. Uh, one question, sir. Uh, I'm not sure whether this is related. What is quantum Zeno effect, and uh, what uh, part with uh, Raisin Lab uh, playing quantum Zeno? Effect? Okay. So the, did you mention the Raisin Lab? Yeah. Okay. I'm not sure what they've. Uh, okay. Well, I'm not sure what they've done on this. I know they've done some work on that. But let me tell you what, how the Zeno effect is related to this. The Zeno effect is simply when you open the box, you collapse. Well, this is sort of the classic description of the Zeno effect. It's actually more subtle. You collapse it back to the top shelf. Okay. So if, as I was asked, what if I try to apply pulses while it's on the top shelf? What will happen? Well, the, the fact that I'm measuring it is going to pin it to the top shelf. So that means that half pulse is going to be ineffective at creating a superposition state. Okay, so it inhibits quantum evolution because we're perturbing it with measurement. We're pinning the state due to wave function collapse. So that's the role of, of Zeno effect. And there's lots of different ways to think about it. There's lots of ways to connect it to um, controlling systems. And there's things called the anti-Zeno effect where the opposite effect happens and, and so forth. So, so it's a very fun topic.